I have started the recording. Um, I would like to welcome everyone to the second physics colloquium of fall semester. And this is our first research talk. Um, as all of you remember, the talk last week was uh, a safety EHS talk. Um, it's my pleasure to welcome Professor Stephanie Law from the University of Delaware to speak to you about photons, plasmons, polaritons, optical phenomena in complex materials. Uh, Professor Stephanie Law received her bachelor's degree in physics from Iowa State University and her PhD in physics from the University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign. She then held a postdoctoral position in electrical engineering at the University of Illinois before moving to the University of Delaware as a Claire Booth Luce Assistant Professor in Material Science and Engineering. So Professor Law has a truly multidisciplinary background that includes physics, material science, as well as electrical engineering. Um, she is now an assistant professor, an associate professor. I'm sorry. You got tenure how long ago? It was fairly Seven recent. Ago. Seven days ago. <laughs> so we can congratulate Professor Law on very recently getting tenure and uh, as of a week ago, becoming an associate professor of physics, a professor of material science and engineering, who also holds an affiliate appointment in the Department of Physics and Astronomy at Delaware. Um, she is the co-director of the University of Delaware Materials Growth Facility and an associate editor for the Journal of Vacuum Science and Technology. She has won a number of prestigious awards, including the North American Molecular Beam Epitaxy Young Investigator Award, the DOE Early Career Award, the AVS Peter Mark Memorial Award, and quite impressively, the Presidential Early Career Award for Scientists and Engineers. So let's all welcome Professor Law and we look forward to hearing your talk. So now I will hand things over to you. Thank you, and thank you guys so much for inviting me. I'm really excited to uh, be able to present to you. Currently, it says that screen sharing is disabled by the host. Uh oh, so oh, let's see. Disabled. Who can oh, share? No, it's working now. Okay. Okay, great. Good. Okay, so let me get my pointer. All right, so you can see my pointer. Yep. Yes. Excellent. All right, so after discussing with everybody beforehand, I think the plan is going to be my talk is in basically two parts. So I'll go through the first part of the talk and then I'll pause for questions. So if you have questions, you'll have an opportunity to ask them then. Or you can wait till the end of the talk and we'll do questions at the end also. So I'm delighted to talk to you today about photons, plasmons, and polaritons. And so I promise I will go through this hopefully pretty slowly, hopefully at a level that's accessible to you know, most physics PhD students. But first, I always like to start with this, especially for people who aren't from the East Coast, which is, where is the University of Delaware? So I am from Iowa originally, and then I was at Illinois. And so Delaware is a very teeny tiny little state here in the mid-Atlantic. So if you zoom in on this part, this is the state of Delaware here. There's Philadelphia, there's New York City. Then there's Baltimore and DC. And the University of Delaware is right here in this little tiny corner of Delaware, right by Pennsylvania and Maryland. So this is where we are uh, on the uh, Eastern seaboard here. All right, so talk about some research. So what is the goal of my research lab? So our goal is understanding and synthesizing quantum materials and heterostructures to realize devices with novel designer optical properties. All right, so how do we do that? The main tool that my lab uses is molecular beam epitaxy. And so what is molecular beam epitaxy? It's not as complicated as it sounds. It's an ultra high vacuum technique for depositing thin films one layer of atoms at a time. So on the left here, you can see a little cartoon that I drew of the MBE chamber. Basically in the chamber, and this is an actual photograph of one of our MBE systems, in the chamber is ultra high vacuum. So the pressure inside the chamber is about 10 to the minus 10 torr, right? Atmospheric pressure is 760 torr. So we're something like one trillionth atmospheric pressure. It's about the same vacuum at the International Space Station. So the vacuum inside the MBE is extremely good. And what we do is we have different elemental sources. So our gallium source is literally just chunks of gallium sitting inside a crucible that we heat up. The gallium evaporates, it hits the substrate, and the atoms, if you look in the schematic on the right, the atoms hit the substrate and they can diffuse around on the substrate to find a low free energy position, a good position. 
And if you have, for example, gallium atoms and arsenic atoms hitting the substrate, you can grow one layer of gallium arsenide at a time, literally a single layer of atoms, and then the next layer of atoms, and then the next layer of atoms, and so on. Right? Epitaxy just means that the film that we are growing has a crystalline relationship with the substrate. That's what epitaxy means. And so this is the major technique that my lab uses. This is how we make all of our samples, all of the materials I'm going to talk about, and all of the structures that I'll talk about. So as a side little plug for the materials growth facility, so this is actually a user facility that we have at the University of Delaware. Within the last year, we just established this. We have two um, dedicated Vico Gen Explorer MBE systems. So we have one for traditional 3-5 semiconductors, arsenides and antimonides, and one for calcogenide-based materials. And so if anybody at all is interested in any of the materials I'm talking about today or anything related, this is a user facility, so external people can absolutely use it. You don't have to be an expert. We have a staff member, Dr. Chris Shuck, who's fantastic, who either do a growth for you, teach you how to do it yourself. So there's a lot of, a lot of ways you can take advantage of this facility. So, you know, either email us, or sorry, go to our website here, or you can send me an email if you want more information about the materials growth facility. All right, so this is the first part of the talk. It's gonna be about plasmon polaritons in semiconductors. And again, I promise I'll take a pause halfway through in case anybody has questions. All right, so I just want to make sure we all start from the same place. So if you're already familiar with this, I apologize, but I want to talk a little bit about how we describe the interaction of light and materials, right? So if we shine light on a material, we want to know what happens to that light. And so how do we describe this interaction? Well, we describe it by talking about the permittivity of a material. So the permittivity of a material tells you how the charges in the material respond to the incident light. And this is a frequency dependent quantity, right? The permittivity of the material is going to depend on the frequency of the light that's shining on it. So a metal, an optical metal, is something that is reflective and has a negative permittivity. In this talk, whenever I talk about a metal, I just mean something with a negative permittivity. It may or may not conduct electricity well. Dielectric is something that is transparent and it has a positive permittivity. And this is the Drude model. So the Drude model is a very nice model for modeling the permittivity of materials, including the doped semiconductors I'm gonna talk about next. So here's the permittivity. Like I said, it's a function of frequency, and it depends on, these are just some constants that I wouldn't worry about, but it depends on these quantities here. This is the plasma frequency, or I wrote plasma wavelength up here. I'm an optics person, so I use frequency and wavelength interchangeably. I apologize, I'll try to be careful about that in this talk. So the plasma wavelength or the plasma frequency tells you, for example, the wavelength below which the material is optically metallic, right? Remember, the permittivity is a function of frequency. So there is some wavelength below which it's a metal and above which it's a dielectric. That wavelength is the plasma wavelength, where the permittivity goes from positive to negative. And in the Drude model, the plasma wavelength or the plasma frequency depends on the density of free carriers in electrons for the case of all of our materials. The, uh, again, these are just some constants, and then the effective mass of the carriers, right? So by changing the density of electrons in your material, you can change its plasma wavelength. You can change the wavelength at which it goes from being reflective to being transparent. So the materials that we're interested in are doped semiconductors, specifically 3-5 semiconductors, like indium arsenide, indium gallium arsenide, indium antimonide, and so on. These materials are very well described by the Drude model. They're almost perfect Drude materials. And the reason we like them is that they have a combination of a high doping and small effective mass. So this number, the doping density, can be really big, and this number can be really small. Right? If you have a large numerator and a small denominator, you get a large plasma frequency. In our case, the plasma frequency is going to be somewhere within the infrared, where there currently are not really great plasmonic materials. And a bonus is that these materials can be integrated with existing semiconductor structures. There's already a ton of optoelectronic structures in the infrared made from semiconductors. So if we want to grow everything in one you know, make one device, grow it all by MBE, we can do this. So in principle, semiconductors should be perfect designer infrared metals because we can actually change, we can control the doping of a semiconductor. 
I'm not going to go into the details here. I'm happy to talk about growth for hours and hours and hours. But the idea here is if I'm growing indium arsenide, indium is a group three and arsenic is a group five, right? So three plus five is eight. So all the electrons, you know, all the bonds are satisfied. But you can sprinkle in, you can add a little bit of silicon. Silicon is a group four. Turns out that silicon prefers to sit on the indium site. So the silicon, it's only using three electrons for bonding. So it has one electron left over. And that electron is basically a free electron donated to the indium arsenide. So by choosing how much silicon we dope in, we can change this doping density and we can actually control the optical properties of these materials. So just to give you a really brief example, this really does work. What I'm showing you here is the real part of the material permittivity, right? Remember, if the permittivity is positive, it's a dielectric, and if the permittivity is negative, it's a metal. And remember, the point at which it crosses zero, that's the plasma wavelength. So you can see in all these materials, as we change the doping density, right? These are all different doping densities here. We're tuning the plasma wavelength from about 5.5 microns all the way to, I think, 17 in this case, and we can certainly go to longer wavelengths. Right, so these are really very tunable materials. The growth is actually sort of tricky, but it's definitely doable. And as a sidebar for any optics people who are listening, the imaginary part of the permittivity tells you about the optical losses, right? This is bad, right? You wanna be able to shine light on your material and not have it be lost to heat, for example. And so you want the permittivity, to, the imaginary part of the permittivity to be quite small. And when we grow these right, which again is, is a little tricky, the losses can be relatively small, right? This is a, a reasonable amount of optical losses. So these are pretty good metals in the infrared. So I'm gonna now skip over a whole bunch of device related stuff and talk about something that I think is really very cool. So I told you already, materials are either metals with a negative permittivity or dielectrics with a positive permittivity. But you can actually make a metal dielectric composite so imagine that we grow a stack like this, right? This is what MBE is good at, stacking stuff up. So in this case, you grow a stack like this where each layer is really thin, much thinner than the wavelength of light. So we have a doped layer, this is a metal layer, then we have a dielectric layer, then we have a metal layer, then a dielectric, and a metal and a dielectric, and we stack all these up. And remember, they're each really, really thin. So when the light shines on this material, what it sees is a composite. It sees something that has metal parts and dielectric. Turns out you can solve Maxwell's equations for this entire composite and you get something called effective medium theory. And what you find out is that this composite material has one permittivity in the perpendicular direction, which is the Z direction here, and a different permittivity in the parallel direction. It's anisotropic, right? It's different in this direction than it is in this direction. And in particular, in some frequency ranges, this composite acts like, sorry, acts like a metal in one direction and a dielectric in the other direction. It has a positive permittivity in one direction and a negative permittivity in the other direction. So if we just look at this black trace here, we can see that in this case, the perpendicular permittivity is negative in this shaded region and the parallel permittivity is positive. And then at longer wavelengths, the parallel permittivity becomes negative and the perpendicular becomes positive. Right? So this thing is acting like a metal in one direction and a dielectric in the other. And we can actually tune its properties. Ah, good, that was the next slide. We can tune its properties. And again, I'm not gonna go through this in detail. All I wanna show you here is that we can make these things out of indium arsenide. So we grew a bunch of samples where we changed the doping, right? We changed this plasma wavelength. So if you look again at these doped layers, we basically changed the wavelength at which these layers became metallic. And what you can see is that we're shifting, we're shifting the onset of this weird behavior. So we can do this experiment, we can do the modeling, we can extract the permittivities. They look just like we think they should. This is actually not the exciting part. This is kind of the boring part. This is the exciting part, or one of the exciting parts. These materials, because of the way that they are, right, because they're metallic in one direction and dielectric in the other, they can bend light backwards, right? So normally, Light comes in, right, it shines on a material. I usually do this in person, so I, it's hard for me to gesture on the screen. But anyway, light comes in and it shines on a material, 
And if it comes in at an angle, it bends toward the surface normal, right? That's how index of refraction works. In one of these hyperbolic metamaterials, the light comes in and instead of just bending toward surface normal, it actually bends backwards beyond surface normal. And we can see that in these materials that we're making. We can actually see the light bending backwards. So we did this experiment where this is the metamaterial in purple. Light comes in like this, and then it's transmitted. And we block half the transmitted light. We just put a razor blade behind. So block half the transmitted light. Now, if it's normal refraction, you expect to see a dip in the transmission, right? Because the light is now being blocked by the blade. But for negative refraction, the light's going to bend the other way. And we would expect to see a peak in transmission because the light is now going around the blade. And that's exactly what we see. So we have a variety of conditions that we used. What you can see is that when the blade is placed on the left side, we see a peak. And when it's placed on the right side, we see a dip. Right? So in the one case, we're blocking the light in the negative refraction. In the other case, we're letting it go around. So this material actually can bend light backwards. It can do all sorts of other cool stuff. It can actually also focus light to sub-wavelength spots, can slow light down, can do lots of cool things. But what I haven't told you is really the whole point of all of this, which is I'm calling them hyperbolic metamaterials. And the metamaterial part makes sense, right? We're building up this material out of all these little blocks. But they're actually hyperbolic. And what do I mean by that? So I'm speaking to a bunch of physicists, right? Presumably you all look at Fermi surfaces. This is the same idea. This is called an isofrequency surface, what you're looking at here. So what I'm showing you, let's just look at panel A. In panel A, we have a plot of the wave vector in the x direction, the wave vector of light in the z direction, and then the wave vector of light in the y direction. It's going in and out of the plane. And what I'm showing you is for a given frequency of light, which wave vectors can propagate in a material. This is just the same as a Fermi surface, right? In a Fermi surface, you say, OK, for a given energy, right, what wave vectors can my electrons have? This is the same thing. For a given frequency of light, what wave vector can my photon have? Right? It's just like a Fermi surface for light. In a normal material, it's closed and boring. Right? No matter which direction you look, when I shine light on of a given frequency, it will have a wave vector that lies on this closed sphere. But in these hyperbolic metamaterials, where we stack up metal and dielectric, metal and dielectric, metal and dielectric, it turns out, again, if you solve Maxwell's equations, you get these open hyperbolic isofrequency surfaces. So why does this matter? This matters because this fundamentally allows you to beat the diffraction limit of light. If any of you have ever taken an intro optics course, that's one of the first things you learn, right? You can't see below the diffraction limit of light. You can't focus below the diffraction limit of light. But nobody ever tells you why that is. The reason is because really small features, right? If the size is really small, their wave vector is going to be really big, right? Because it's inversely proportional. Well, at a given frequency of light, things with large wave vectors do not propagate, right? They decay away exponentially close to the surface. This is fundamentally why you can't image things below the diffraction limit of light. If you got really, really close to the object, you could, because actually these large wave vector modes are very close to the surface. But they can't propagate into the air because of this closed isofrequency surface. Right? This is why you can't image below the diffraction limit of light. It's also why there's a limit on how tightly you can focus a beam of light. But in these metamaterials, these large wave vector modes can propagate. In principle, you can have an infinitely large wave vector. Of course, in real life, you can't. But you can get very large wave vectors. And so you can do subdiffraction imaging. You can do subwavelength focusing. You can put light into sub-wavelength waveguides and route it on chip if they are made of these you know, fancy metamaterials. And this is why they're so cool, because you have this huge isofrequency surface. All right, so where did these large wave vector modes come from? I've just sort of like waved my hands at you, like, oh, this is what it looks like. So let's talk a little bit about what happens, again, when we shine light from one medium, into a second one. So I have light from medium one 
and it's hitting this interface between medium one and medium two. So what can it do? Well, it can reflect. If medium two is a metal, right? If it has a negative permittivity, the light's gonna reflect. It can refract or transmit if medium two is a dielectric. Or there's actually a third thing that can happen, which is it can couple into a surface wave. Now this only happens at a specific frequency or a specific wavelength. And this surface wave is called a surface plasmon polariton, right? Here, here comes the plasmon polaritons that I promised you. So what kind of wave is this? So don't panic, but a polariton is a quasi-particle that results from strong coupling between a photon and any electromagnetic dipole. So you can have a plasmon polariton, you can have a phonon polariton, right? You can have lots of different kinds of polaritons. So it's strong coupling between a photon and a dipole. Let's look at this dispersion curve here. Here we have frequency on the y-axis, wave vector on the x-axis. This is the dispersion of a photon, right? This is the light line. It's just CK over root epsilon d. This is the dispersion of a photon. It's a straight line, right, with the slope of, of the speed of light. In a material, you can excite this surface plasmon. The surface plasmon itself is a collective oscillation of all the electrons in the material. <clears throat> all the electrons in the material can oscillate collectively at some particular frequency, right? You can imagine that they oscillate back and forth at some particular frequency that depends on the material itself. If I shine light on the material, that photon can couple to that oscillating electron frequency, which is shown here, and you can create a surface plasmon polariton. And this is sort of the classic strong coupling behavior where you have one mode like this, one mode like this, they couple together to make a new quasi particle, and now it has this sort of anti crossing behavior. In real life, we only ever care about this bottom branch. I'm going to totally ignore the top branch. This is what the dispersion of a surface plasmon polariton looks like. So over here, it's basically like a photon. And over here at large wave vector, it's basically like a surface plasmon. And in between, this quasi particle has some character of the photon and some character of the surface plasmon. So this is what it looks like surface plasmon polariton. It's propagating, usually, it's propagating electron density wave coupled to a photon. So you have an electron density wave in your metal, and it's coupled to the photon. It has both light wave and electron density wave characteristics. And it can exist at any interface between a metal and a dielectric. Anytime you have a metal dielectric interface, you could have a surface plasmon polariton living at that interface. There's a very strong electric field at that interface. That's what's being shown in the cartoon and with these electric field lines here. And this surface plasmon polariton is tightly bound to the interface. It's very, like the decay length is much less than the wavelength of light. And there are a lot of applications in waveguiding, gas sensing, refractive index sensing, and so on and so forth that I'm not going to go into right now. So this is the surface plasmon polariton. It can exist at any metal dielectric interface, and its electric field is tightly bound, and it decays away in the, in the vertical direction, in the z direction, away from the interface. So now let's think about our hyperbolic metamaterials. Remember, the metamaterials are alternating layers of metal and dielectric. So at every single metal dielectric interface, you could have a surface plasmon polariton. So we have one at this interface, and one at this interface, and one at this interface, and one at this interface. But these layers are really thin. They're very, very thin. In fact, they're so thin that the decay, the exponential decay of the surface plasmon at this interface interacts with the exponential decay of the surface plasmon at this interface. These two surface plasmons can couple to each other, and to this one, and to this one, right, throughout the entire volume of this metamaterial. So instead of just having, for example, two harmonic oscillators that couple and give you two new modes, now you have however many layers that you have, right? So you have lots and lots and lots of these surface plasmon polaritons coupling together to give you these new modes. They're called they have a lot of names. I like to call them volume plasmon polaritons because they're in the volume of the metamaterial. They're literally just standing waves, right? You have a fundamental standing wave, you'll have a first order, second order, third order, and so on. 
These are the modes that carry that sub-wavelength information, and these are the modes that make up that isofrequency surface that we just talked about. Oh, yeah, I forgot I had this. Yeah, so exactly. So you have coupling. Again, it's just like coupling in uh, block waves. It's actually identically, it's mathematically identical to block waves in a um, coupled quantum wells or in a crystal. The math is exactly the same. And this is a just a COMSOL, an electromagnetic simulation of one of our metamaterials. And you can see we have the zeroth order volume plasma polariton mode. It has zero nodes in it. This is the fundamental standing wave. Then we have the first order. It has one node in it. And then the second order has two nodes in it. The third order has three nodes. It gets a little harder to see. So on and so forth. They're just standing waves, but they're special standing waves, right? Because they carry all of this sub-wavelength information. So we wanted to see if we could actually make these and if we could actually see them in our semiconductor hyperbolic metamaterials. So I'm going to try to speed up a little bit because I think I'm going too slowly. Um, but essentially, what we did is we grew this metamaterial. You can actually see the metal layers are darker here in the SEM. These are the doped layers. These are the undoped layers. Um, I actually hadn't expected to see this. I was pretty excited. And then we put a gold grating on top. We have to put the gold grating on top because remember, the momentum of these volume plasma polariton modes is huge. It's much larger than the momentum of light in free space. So we have to do something to match the momentum, and a grating coupler is the easiest way to do it. So what we did is we grew a bunch of metamaterials, we fabricated these grating couplers, and then if you change the period of the grating coupler, you change the wave vector of light. So by changing the period of the grating coupler, we can actually map out the dispersion of these modes. And that's exactly what we did. And I'm just going to skip to the one that works the best, which is this material pair, indium arsenide and aluminum antimonide. And if we just look at this one here, this is the first order VPP mode. You can see it's a dip in reflection. And you can see as we change the period of the grating, which is in this legend here, we can watch this mode move. We can actually map its dispersion as we change the period of the grating. Let's skip this for now. And in addition to that, we can actually get selective thermal emission. This works in the infrared. So if you have an absorption peak, an absorption dip, excuse me, in the infrared, you can also get an emission peak. So we can get selective thermal emission from these modes. OK, so that was a brief, very brief explanation of some of our work on these uh, semiconductor plasma polaritons. So the next part of the talk is on topological insulators, which is the thing I thought would be probably more interesting to a physics audience. Um, but I'm certainly happy to answer any questions that anybody has now before we move on to the uh, topological insulator part. So let me see if I can get this question thing. Ah, there we go. Perfect. Yeah, so there was a question asking, how do you control the distribution of each source material onto each layer? Oh, that's a really good question. Yeah, so when we grow the films, we actually rotate the substrate during growth. So if the indium source is here and the arsenic source is over here, and they're shining onto the substrate. We're rotating it during growth. So the whole thing is getting you know, equal, equal amounts of indium and arsenic as we rotate. And so that's how you end up getting, you actually get quite good uniformity. Um, nowadays, MBE systems across a three inch wafer, the uniformity is like plus minus 3%. It's extremely uniform as long as you keep this rotation on during growth. So every part of the substrate sees, sees a uniform flux. Any other questions about this part? Ah, do you know how the nonlinear index of refraction is affected by this process? Uh, by which process? My yeah. guess is uh, this is this is Randy, um, but my guess is he's asking just the overall process of making the stack and possibly putting the grading on top and coupling into it. Basically, is there a way to calculate the nonlinear index? based on uh, the fabrication process? So the nonlinear index, actually, we have a collaborator in Germany who's trying to look at all these nonlinear properties like right now. Their lab was shut down because of COVID, obviously, like everybody else. Um, but these materials actually have some really interesting nonlinear properties. I don't want to speculate too much on it because we're you know, getting data right now as we speak. Well, I hope. They're supposed to be measuring it right now as we speak. Um, so I don't want to speculate too much on that. Um, they do have very strong nonlinearities, which should hopefully be really interesting. 
oh, could you use modulation doping instead of silicon doping to voltage control the dielectric constant of each layer, say with a gate? You know, this is something I've wanted to do forever. So what I, what I think this questionnaire is asking is, could we tune the carrier density in the layers in situ, like after we make it, so that we could like turn it on and off or change the property of the metamaterial in situ? And this is such a great idea and it doesn't work. We have tried and tried and tried and tried and tried. The, the short answer to your question is, in order to get plasma wavelengths in the infrared, you need doping densities of order like 10 to the 19 electrons per cubic center, centimeter or 10 to the 20 electrons per cubic centimeter, which is an enormous amount. And it turns out the gate voltage you need to control that is so big that it causes dielectric breakdown. And if you use modulation doping, you actually don't get enough doping to make it work in the infrared. It's a great idea and we have, yeah, I would love to have a way to make it work, but unfortunately, yeah, we can't, we cannot make that work. What kind of thermal capacity do the metamaterials have? I mean, they're basically semiconductors. Um, so we haven't done any thermal measurements. No, that's not true. So there's a guy at UD who's really interested in looking at actually the thermal transport properties of the metamaterials, but he did some back of the envelope calculations and he decided they would not be very interesting. That's pretty much all I got. We talked about it briefly and he decided he, yeah, he decided it wasn't worth looking at. Um, but I can talk more about that later if somebody's interested. Uh, does remote doping increase or change the anisotropy over conventional doping? Oh yeah, and a bunch of couple two days. Oh, hold this question and I think I will answer it next. And if I don't, I will answer it again at the end. But hang on to that question because the next part is going to talk about basically coupled two digs. So hang on to that question. These were great questions, everybody. Okay. So I will move on to the topological insulator part and I will try to be a little more brief. We'll see how well that works, um, but I don't want to keep you guys late. Okay. So now we're going to talk about Dirac plasmon polaritons and strong coupling to phonons. So. Again, if you fell asleep in the first part or were bored in the first part, the second part is quite different. So you can wake up and pay attention at this point. Topological insulators. These are newish materials, newer than semiconductors at least. And so I like to give a little bit of an experimentalist's understanding of what a topological insulator is. I'm not a theorist, I'm an experimentalist. So this is my cartoon version of how they work. In a normal material, a non-topological non insulator, Normally, you would say your conduction band is basically made of states with S symmetry. And your valence band is basically made of states with P symmetry. This is true for 3-5 semiconductors. In a topological insulator, you have really, really strong spin orbit coupling. So strong that it actually pulls the conduction band down and pushes the valence band up. So now it's inverted, like we're showing in the second panel here. Nature does not like these sort of crossings. So you get, you end up with a sort of band structure. I, I don't like to use the word renormalization, but you end up with a band structure that looks like this third panel. Where now, at the bottom of the conduction band, you have some states with P symmetry. And at the top of the valence band, you have some states with S symmetry. This is inverted, right? This is the opposite of what, what it should be like. If you take this inverted material and put it next to a normal material, these states, it's gonna to wanna to unwind the inversion, right? It's gonna to wanna to connect the S states back to the S ones and the P to the P. Or if you're a theorist and can actually do the math, basically you apply the boundary conditions and you find out that you end up with these surface states. These surface states form a Dirac cone and they are physically at the surface of the topological insulator. Wherever the topological insulator meets a normal material or a vacuum, which is a normal material, you get these surface states. The topological insulator meets another topological insulator, you don't get any surface states because they're both inverted. There's nothing to unwind. So basically, a topological insulator has a bulk band gap crossed by these surface states with linear dispersion that form a Dirac cone. This might remind you of graphene, and in fact, this is the analogy that one of my former students used to use. Lots of people can understand this. Graphene, semiconductor graphene. Everybody understands this. A topological insulator is basically the same thing, 
you have surface states, if it's a thin film, you have surface states on the bottom and the top of the film. And in principle, you should have something that's bulk insulating in between. What's special about topological insulators and what's different than graphene, so what's the same as graphene? These surface states are two-dimensional, just like graphene. They have massless electrons, just like graphene. The electrons travel at a substantial fraction of the speed of light, just like graphene. But unlike graphene, they exhibit spin momentum locking. This means that an electron traveling in the plus x direction will have spin in the minus y direction. It's just the way it is. This also means that an electron traveling in the plus x direction with spin in the minus y direction can't just scatter into a different surface state with a different momentum because it would also have to undergo a spin flip, right? So this means that electrons in the surface states traveling in the plus x direction can't just scatter into other surface states in the absence of a magnetic impurity. So that means that you should get very high mobility from these electrons. What we are interested in, or one of the things we're interested in, and the thing I'm gonna tell you all about, is looking at coupled Dirac plasmon resonances, which happen to be in the terahertz. Okay, so just, I'm in material science now, so a brief mention of which material we're gonna look at. We're gonna look at bismuth selenide. It has a relatively large band gap of a whopping 0.3 EV. It's actually not that large, but it's big for a topological insulator. It's pretty easy to grow. It's a binary compound. You grow it by van der Waals epitaxy. Here's its crystal structure. I have a lot of thoughts about how to grow these materials. If people are interested, I can talk about it later. I'm not, I took all the growth slides out to try to not take too long. So we are interested in Dirac plasmon resonances in these topological insulators. So remember, we talked about plasmons 10 minutes ago, right? A plasmon is just an electron density wave, right? It's an oscillation of the electron density. However, in topological insulators, the physics is a little different. These electrons are two-dimensional, they're massless, they're spin polarized, and so we can actually form a Dirac plasmon. Again, this is similar to what you get in graphene, right? If you shine light on a topological insulator, you can form a Dirac plasmon polariton involving the electrons in this top surface state and in the bottom surface state. So, What's, again, what's unique about these topological insulators as compared to graphene is we grow these thin films by MBE, right? They're large area, but they're thin, right? Our films are like 100 nanometers thick, maybe. And the frequency that these plasmon resonances happen at is in the terahertz, which is like 200 microns, right? So we have a 200 micron wavelength light and like a 200 nanometer film. What this means is that you're gonna excite a plasmon on the top surface, plasmon polariton on the top surface and a plasmon polariton on the bottom surface at the same time. And they're going to couple to each other. Just like coupled harmonic oscillators, just like we talked about, you get an acoustic mode and you get an optical mode. We can only see the optical mode because we do optical spectroscopy. But this is what we're interested in looking at. And it turns out that some theorists who are much smarter than me calculated what the dispersion should look like. And this is what the dispersion should look like. So this is telling us what the frequency of this coupled Dirac plasmon polariton should look like as a function of wave vector and as a function of film thickness here, which is going to become important. So we wanted to see, can we see these Dirac plasmon polaritons, right? People hadn't looked. We wanted to see if we could see them. These are theoretical curves showing for three different film thicknesses what the dispersion curves look like. Again, this is the wave vector of the plasmon, and this is the frequency. So you can see as we change the film thickness, the dispersion curves move. And we're going to do basically the same thing that we did before, right? Remember before, to excite the volume plasmon polaritons, we put a grating to match the momentum. In this case, we're not going to fabricate a grating. It turns out we can do something even easier, which is just etch the film into stripes. We're going to set up a standing wave resonance, and the stripe width is going to determine the wave vector. It's the same idea, it's a standing wave resonance. So, as you make the stripe wider, you're making the wave vector lower. That's all that's happening here. So, we're going to grow films of these three different thicknesses. We're going to fabricate them into stripes of three different widths. We're going to measure their optical properties. We're going to look for the plasmon polariton, and we're going to try to map these dispersion curves. Right, that's where we're going. Okay, 
So, oh, I said all of this already. Yeah, so the momentum of the plasmon is always greater than the photon. So we're going to etch it into these stripes. This is just an SEM of the stripes that we've made. Again, it's a standing wave resonance. So the wave vector is just pi over the stripe width. It's a standing wave resonance. And we do Fourier transform infrared spectroscopy measurements to actually measure the optical properties. So what we expect when we shine light on is if the light is polarized this way, if the electric field is along the stripes, we don't expect to see a plasmon. What we expect to see is the alpha phonon here. This is the alpha phonon, and then the beta phonon here near four terahertz. And that's exactly what we see in this red curve. This is extinction, but it's similar to absorption. However, if we polarize the electric field across the stripes like this, now we actually could excite a plasmon polariton. And what we see in the extinction data is this sort of broad peak here. What this is, and again, I'm not going to go into detail, but this is called a FANO interaction between the plasmon, which is basically here, and the phonon. You can see the alpha phonon, which was the strongest feature, is gone. You don't see it at all in the black curve. And it's because of this, this special type of interaction that we have called a FANO interaction. So as I said, we're going to make three different film thicknesses, 50, 100, 200 nanometers, and then three different stripe widths. We're going to measure the extinction for all of them. And what you see is you can see this peak is shifting. The plasmon peak is shifting pretty much like we expect as we change the stripe width and as we change the film thickness. But this is consistent with coupled direct plasmons, but we really need to actually extract the peak position, right? You can't just look at this and say, ah, yes, we excited what we wanted to see. So we do some modeling. We did data fitting. I say this like it's super easy. It took my student a year to figure out how to do this. It's actually like really challenging. So, you know, graduate students who are listening, this is what your advisor does. They say, show one plot. Oh yeah, and then we did this data fitting and it was really easy. Yeah, it was actually really hard. It took her a long time um, and she's an excellent student. But you can see that actually the fitting does work really well. We have this nice fit. And from this fitting, we can extract a variety of parameters including the plasmon frequency, right? This is what we want. We want to map the dispersion of this mode to prove that it really is a Dirac plasmon polariton and just to understand the excitation, right? That's how you fundamentally understand something is by measuring its dispersion. So this is the plot that has all the data in it. The symbols, these are the extracted plasmon peaks. Right? This is where the plasma modes are experimentally. These curves, the yellow, black, and red curves, these are the theoretical dispersion curves for coupled direct plasmons shown here. What I want to emphasize is that there are no fitting parameters. We didn't use a single fitting parameter. Right? These are all constants. We know the sheet density. We can measure this with Hall effect measurements. This is the permittivity of air, which is just one. This is the permittivity of the sapphire substrate, which we know. And this is the bulk permittivity of bismuth selenide, which we also know. Film thickness and wave vector, we know. There are no fitting parameters here. And you can see that our experimental data matches the theory really quite well. We have a systematic offset here for the smallest stripes. What we think has happened is actually we're, we're ion milling to make the stripes. So we think the edges of the stripes are suffering from fabrication damage. And so the stripe is probably actually thinner than one micron. But we don't know how much thinner, so we did not adjust the wave vector. So this match is really pretty good. Now, the question I get 100% of the time when I present this is, how are you sure that this isn't massive plasmons? These topological insulators are not perfect. They have some massive bulk carriers in them. And they may also have band bending at the surface to create a massive 2 egg. So to answer that, we can say, here's the 2D massive dispersion. It's in this gray dashed line. It's using the same carrier density, it's the measured carrier density. And you can see it doesn't fit at all. It's so far away from our actual measured data. But if you are not convinced by this, we can plot the data a different way. We can plot the plasmon frequency as a function of film thickness. And you can see, again, our experimental data agrees with the coupled direct plasmon dispersion data pretty well. 
And this 2D massive, the bulk you know, 2D massive plasmon dispersion, we had to multiply the carrier density by a factor of 1,000 to get it to show up on the plot. And even when it shows up, the shape is not right. right? This shape of the dashed line is nowhere near what we expect from our experimental data. So we're really quite sure that we have excited coupled direct plasmons in these topological insulators, and our experimental data matches the theoretical prediction quite well. So in the remaining, oh, and actually, I don't want to gloss over this point because it's really interesting. So we can actually measure the effective index and the lifetime of these modes. So what does that mean? The effective index tells you how much does the material compress the wavelength of light. When I shine light of 200 micron wavelength on this material, what is the wavelength of the light inside the material? Right? It's always going to be different. When you shine light you know, on water, it compresses the wavelength a little bit. That's what the index of refraction is. Well, the effective index of our bismuth selenide coupled Dirac plasmons is over 200. This is gigantic. This is really, really big, right? This is about twice what you can get in graphene and much better than what you could get in a, a normal material. Normally, when you confine light, its lifetime goes way down, right? Light doesn't like to be confined. It scatters right out. The lifetime of your plasmon is very, very short. Now, I want to preface this by saying these are not true lifetime measurements. We did not do a pump probe measurement. I would like to do that sometime soon. These are just looking at the full width half max, but it at least gives you an estimate of the plasmon lifetime. And using that method, we get plasmon lifetimes of, you know, three to 500 femtoseconds. This is better than the lifetime of plasmons in graphene measured the same way using the full width half maximum of the excitation. And we attribute this relatively long lifetime to the fact that these electrons, as I said before, they're spin momentum locked, so they can't just scatter out, right? They're, they're sort of stuck in the mode that they're in. And so what this means is that you can think now about using these materials for things like on-chip routing in the terahertz, right? You can find the light, you can route it, you can do sensing, right? There are a lot of terahertz on-chip photonics applications that you could look at with these materials because of this extremely large effective index and simultaneous relatively long lifetime. Okay, so I don't want to keep you guys too long, so I will go very briefly over this last section, but it's our most recent work and I'm pretty excited about it, so I want to talk about it just a little bit. I, I promise I won't keep you late. So we're an MBE group, so what do we want to do? We want to stack things up, right? I already talked about these hyperbolic metamaterials in the semiconductor. So now the next question for us is, of course, well, can we do this with the topological insulators? Can we make a Dirac metamaterial? So people have tried to do this in graphene. It turns out it's actually kind of difficult because it's hard to stack up graphene. You have to do scotch tape transfer, and it's a little bit challenging to make these sort of structures. So topological insulators are a nice way to look at this sort of Dirac hyperbolic metamaterial question. So the first thing we did is create the simplest structure, which is bismuth indium selenide. This is just a normal insulator material. Topological insulator, normal insulator, topological insulator, normal insulator. So we have topological surface states. We have four of them, right, at these four interfaces here. This is what the structure looks like. This is the TEM image. This is an AFM image. I want to see it from the top and a zoomed in TEM. So this is what we grew for surface states. It's not really wavy like this. This is an artifact of the fib. So again, I think I put too much in here, but I was too excited. Um, basically, what we wanted to do is see, can we couple these states together? And so I'll just skip to the punchline, which is, yes, we actually can. And it's pretty cool. So if we change the size of the spacer layer, this was the first thing we did. We did two different series where we changed the size of the spacer layer. We fabricated them into stripes again, changed the stripe width to change the wave vector. And these are what the extinction curves look like for these different stripe widths, right? So each of these is a different wave vector. And you can see all sorts of modes in here. The black lines are the multiple Fano resonance fitting that my student did. He then also created a whole T matrix model which is what you're seeing in the color plot, to actually model what we expect from these samples. And the upshot of this is 
that these solid squares or solid symbols, these are the extracted resonant positions. The color plot is his model. But this red line here, this red line is what we would expect if they were not coupled. So the point is that this is the dispersion we would expect if they were uncoupled, and that's not what we see at all. What we see is exactly what we would expect for coupling of these modes. And we can zoom in on this section here that I highlighted in light blue. And what we're seeing here is actually coupling between the plasmon modes and the beta phonon in this material. So this is what it looks like with phonons. You can see this is our data, matches our T-matrix modeling pretty well. But without phonons, this is what you would expect. Here's the beta phonon frequency, and here's the plasmon frequency. And remember, we talked about this strong coupling earlier in the context of plasmon polaritons. You can get the same thing here. So instead of just seeing one plasmon mode that goes straight through like this, we see a strong coupling or this avoided level crossing where the plasmon mode bends over because of the interaction with the beta phonon, and then you have an upper branch here that bends backwards. So we can also do things like change the spacer layer and see how the modes move. And we can change the topological insulator thickness and see how these modes move. And again, the upshot of this is we actually do get some really interesting behavior for very thin layers where we get deviation from our model. And we think this is actually some quantum mechanical strong coupling that's not captured by our model. But I'm basically out of time. So I uh, glossed through that kind of quickly. I do apologize. I didn't think it would take me that long to get through it. Anyway, to sum up, I hope I've convinced you that topological insulators are very cool materials. They have really interesting optical properties where you have these massless two-dimensional spin polarized electrons. They can couple to each other. We can create multi-layers. And so the next goal is to create a Dirac metamaterial, right? Can we do this bending light backwards in the terahertz with the Dirac metamaterial, right? Can we do, you know, uh, sub-wavelength focusing? Can we do sub-wavelength waveguiding, right? These are the sorts of things that we want to be able to do with these materials. So before I end, I just want to thank, these are my students. Daniel is the one who did all that work on the topological insulator multilayers. It was a Herculean effort, and I, you know, he's done a great job as have all the rest of my students and postdocs, and of course, funding from the NSF and the Department of Energy. So with that, I will stop talking, and I can see if you have any more questions about these topological insulators. Hey, thank you very much, Professor Law, for that excellent, very interesting talk. And I want to first go back, let's look at Professor Zimmerman's question and see if that were answered. Um, I don't quite know how to move it back. Uh, Stephanie, if you look at the answered question. Yes, you can see it. Yes, you can see it. Yeah, so um, that was the question. Does remote doping increase or change the anisotropy over conventional doping in a bunch of coupled two digs? Yeah, so I'm not sure if I quite answered your question, but essentially with the topological insulators, what you're doing is coupling a bunch of two digs together. They're massless two digs instead of massive two digs. But fundamentally, the physics is, is pretty similar, right? So you have coupling of all these two digs together. And again, the physics, the physics would be similar. So I'm not totally sure if I answered your question. If I didn't, maybe you can ask it again, because I'm not 100% I'm not sure what, what you meant. I don't know if anybody else can help me out. OK, and I have promoted oh, Professor Zimmer into panelists such that he can ask it. Perfect. <laughs> if he so wishes. <laughs> if he wishes, yes, there we go. <laughs> okay, sorry, didn't, didn't know how I'm doing this. Um, so, so I had a uh, MBE background. Actually, I knew Josh side. I saw him. Oh, in nice. um, I was a, a grad student with him. Um, but if I was, I, I think of effective media maybe a little bit more simplistically than, than you do. But I was thinking if you really wanted to change the anisotropy, if you were to move into, you know, you had regions where you're like indium arsenide, doped indium arsenide, indium arsenide. Mm -hmm. um, but if you really wanted to change the anisotropy, I thought if you were to put this um, 
basically make, if you were to make two DEGs at each interface, that would drastically change it. So that I, I just oh, wondered like, yeah. if you really want to change in isotropy, you do something else there. Yeah, no, I, I see what you're saying. Yeah, so people have done that actually. Um, and it works really well, but it only works in sort of the very far infrared or terahertz. So again, the doping densities are just not high enough for the infrared, but it totally works. And it works really well actually in the far infrared. Okay, cool, thanks. It looks like we have a question here. Since the bismuth selenide is deposited on a dielectric substrate, are the top surface and bottom surface SPPs at different frequencies? This is a really good question. This is a really good question. This is something that we worried about actually quite a bit because as you note, right, air has permittivity of one and sapphire has a permittivity of more than one. So the answer to your question is yes, actually, they really are at slightly different frequencies. And so if you look at these just single layers, they're, they're at slightly different frequencies. Fortunately, you can see how wide, how wide these excitations are. So it turns out the frequency difference between the top surface and the bottom surface is much smaller than the width of the excitation. And so we are still able to get the, to get the strong coupling. But what we've done with these multi-layers is just avoid that problem by encapsulating everything with bismuth indium selenide. So now everything has the same dielectric material on either side of it to try to avoid this problem. But yeah, that's a, that's a very good point. The other thing that we worry about actually on that note is whether or not the two surface states have the same carrier density. Right? Because if you have any band bending at the top surface or the bottom surface, one might have a different carrier density than the other. And so again, that's part of why we've started doing this bismuth indium selenide encapsulation to make sure that if there's band bending, it's at least symmetric on both sides to try to make these um, surface states as similar as possible. Okay, great, thank you. Do we have any other questions? Feel free to either raise your hand and we can promote you to panelist or type it in the question and answer box. So I don't think, okay, it looks as if we don't have any more questions. And um, though, of course, if you do have questions, feel free to send Professor Law an email. You can also send an email to myself or Professor Adams, and we can absolutely forward the question. Ah, here we go. Professor Collins has another question. Can you get something fundamental like energy or frequency from the separation of the anti-crossing? Yeah, oh. another really excellent question. Um, so I think the answer should be yes. But if you look, for example, at, at this plot here, I think it's probably the clearest here. This anti-crossing separation is not very big, actually, right? It's like, you're going to be generous. It's a terahertz. And it's one terahertz out of four. And the, the real problem that we have run into is the line widths of these things are, are relatively large, right? The line width of each resonance is of order a terahertz. And so I'm calling it strong coupling because that is, I think, the easiest and most accessible language. But you could argue about whether or not it's truly strong coupling, right? Because for strong coupling, you want the coupling to be, the coupling strength to be larger than the line width of each individual excitation. And so in this case, the beta phonon line width is pretty narrow, but the plasma line width is actually pretty broad. And so whether or not it's truly strong coupling is something that we have been trying to figure out a better way of determining. So in principle, yes, we should be able to get exactly this energy and frequency, but in practice, it has proven to be more difficult than we would like. Oh, and then another question. How might one improve the models beyond the dream model to include quantum effects, spin orbit coupling to describe the thin film topological and Slater results? Yeah, so I don't know. I am not a theorist. However, there was a really excellent paper published recently, and I don't, no, I don't have it in here. Um, there was a really great paper published like within the last handful of months that talked exactly about this question, actually. So about quantum mechanical interference effects when you have basically 
coupling between things that are very thin. So it, it applies exactly to the situation. Like how do you, so what they were looking at is actually like gold nanoparticles. And you excite plasmon modes on the two gold nanoparticles and you bring them really, really, really close together such that you get, for example, quantum tunneling or other quantum mechanical effects. And then how do you describe the interaction between those gold nanoparticles that are so close together? And so I think that you should be able to extend you should be able to apply that same formalism to this system. This system is more complicated against its two-dimensional and massless and spin polarized, although I don't think the spin is important here. Um, so I think one should be able to do that, but it's a little bit beyond our expertise, right? The T-matrix modeling is about as far down the modeling rabbit hole as I would like to go. So if somebody out there is a theorist and would like to do this, I would love to hear the answer. Okay, hey, thank you very much. Do we have any more questions? We are running out of time, but uh, we can wait uh, maybe another 30 seconds if somebody has another question that they'd like to type into the question and answer box. Okay. I think that is about it. I'm sure as soon as I say it's time to go, another question is going <laughs> to pop up. <laughs> but again, um, feel free to uh, email us your other your remaining questions, and um, we can forward them. So let's all thank Professor Law for the great talk. Um, thank you for the invitation. This was really fun. You had a lot of really good questions. Very impressed. Great. Sorry, I saw a hand raise that I was looking at, but thank you very much. Bye, everyone. We will see you next week on Tuesday. Oh, no, we will not. It is career day. Is that correct, Dan? I don't know, but I will check. Okay. <laughs> there will be an email. Okay. I believe that we skip a week because of career day, and then we will see you the week afterwards, but you will receive an email. Thanks a lot for attending. Thanks again, Stephanie. Thank you.